This is Digital Health Today, episode 38. It's it's a hard, scary thing to do to to start something from scratch. And but it, it's also one of the most rewarding, one of the most exciting things to do. And that that experience gave me the opportunity to to really do that. Welcome to Digital Health Today the podcast focused on the leaders, innovators, and technologies transforming healthcare today and tomorrow. Find us online at digitalhealthtoday.com. Be sure to check out the Accenture Health Tech Innovation Challenge. Accenture is bringing together startups, life sciences companies, and healthcare organizations to tackle the world's biggest healthcare issues, and the second year of the challenge is underway. Check out how the Health Tech Innovation Challenge engages with cutting-edge startups that have a focus on solving healthcare and life sciences problems. Apply online by clicking on the show notes for this episode or simply search for Accenture Health Tech Innovation Challenge. But hurry, applications close on September 1st. Welcome back. This is Digital Health Today, the place to be to get the insights of leaders working to make the healthcare of tomorrow available today. I'm your host, Dan Kendall, and this is episode 38. In our previous episode, we spoke to Kevin Lyman and we spoke about his amazing journey from companies like SpaceX and Microsoft to Enlytic, one of the leading companies developing deep learning technology for healthcare. If you didn't catch it, dial back and download that episode. It's number 37. The application they're developing is so out there that just a short time ago, and I mean a short time, like two years ago, people thought they were crazy. There's no way, they said, that a computer could learn to read scans as well as a human being. Well, we know how that story goes, folks, and we talked about it on that episode. There are now several companies working on similar sorts of incredible solutions to unlock the potential of deep learning in healthcare. That, my friends, is what we call a moonshot. You may be asking, that sounds great. Moonshot, I like the word. It sounds cool. It sounds out there. But what is it? Well, I combed the interwebs to find a definition of what a moonshot is, and surprisingly, there's not a concise definition out there, at least not one that I could find. So let me share what I pulled together about what a moonshot is when we're talking about healthcare. A moonshot is an audacious, ambitious, exploratory, and groundbreaking project. Its impact on humanity, if successful, is enormous. Moonshots are expensive. They require tremendous amounts of human and financial capital. And when you're working on one, frankly, the chances of success are not clear. If you're lucky, you may get a chance to work on one moonshot sometime in your career. If you're exceptional, you may get to double up and work on two or three in your lifetime. And if you're Unity Stokes, you decide to work on 10 moonshots over the next 25 years. Unity Stokes is our guest today, and I think you're going to love this conversation. He's got a great story to tell. Excellent work is being done at Startup Health, the organization that he and Stephen Krein formed, and I'm glad you're here with me to be a part of the conversation. I'm experimenting this week with this episode, and I'd like your help with the experiment. This episode with Unity, I loved recording it. We spoke for over an hour, and we covered all sorts of things. But we spoke for over an hour. I think it was like 75 minutes. And then we finally shut it down, and I had to let him go and get on with his day. But we were having a great time, and the minutes just slipped away. I don't know about you, but I don't listen to a lot of podcasts that are over an hour long. I mean, I really want these podcasts to hit you between your ears, give you some motivation and insight about the exciting things people are working on, and get you pumped to get out and change the world. I mean, you're working to do that already. I'm just bringing you some interesting people to join you as you make your way to work, or you're standing in the checkout line, or flying off to your next meeting. So I decided to try something new. I broke this podcast into two parts. I'll release both episodes on the same day, and you can snack through them in two pieces. Let me know what you think. Is it a good format? Is it too long? Is it too short? I don't know. We're experimenting. We'll figure that out. I'd love to know what you think. You can email me at dan at digitalhealthtoday.com and tell me what's on your mind. In fact, if you've got great things to say, I'd love it if you'd write a review. Jump on digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash review and see how to give me a star rating on iTunes. If it's not good feedback, then please email me. I'm not being funny. I really want to hear from you, the good and the bad, but I can't respond to posts on iTunes, and I really want to make sure that I'm hitting the mark for you and our digital health community. So if there's someone you think I should talk to, a topic you want me to cover, let me know. I want to hear from you. Now, let's talk about our guest, Unity Stokes. This guy has a great story and a great job. He goes to work, and his mission is to improve the well-being of everyone in the world. I said that right. He is working to improve health, not exclusively for his community, not for a few hundred million people, not for people with a certain physical condition or income level. Nope, not Unity Stokes. He just wants to improve the well-being for everyone. Just everyone. Just 7.4 billion people. I walked away from this conversation and realized the most exciting part of his journey is that it is still just the beginning. He's got 20-something years under his belt, and now he set out for vision for another 25 years. He's still in the first half 
and he has done some amazing things. He's got some great stories to tell. Unity and I spoke about his experiences that took him from Iowa to Boston and from New York to the Oval Office. He's an innovator, a batteries included change maker, a health transformer, a successful entrepreneur, and he is leading a charge to reshape our future. On this first part of the conversation, episode 38, Unity takes us through the experiences that shaped his views from childhood to his becoming a health tech innovator. He's got some great stories in there, including his journey to the White House. Then in the second part, episode 39, Unity shares with us his vision for the future. He also does, and I say this as a huge Star Wars fan, He also delivers an incredible Yoda impersonation. You won't want to miss that. Tune into episode 39 to be sure to check that out. As always, grab the notes online at digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 38 and also at digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 39. Now, without further ado, here's our guest, Unity Stokes. Unity, thanks for joining me. Welcome to the program. Uh, Dan, it's great to be here, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Unity, we last were together when we met up at Health 2.0 in Barcelona, and it it was actually 2016, and it was the first time I had a chance to hear about your background, and even we talked about your childhood and your parents, uh, right through to the success that you had in technology in the 90s. Can you give the listeners a little insight into your journey and how you chose the path that you're on today? Yeah, you know, it's funny. One one of the first questions I get a lot is, is... about my name. Um, and I, I often tell the story that I was, I was born at a Bob Dylan concert, which is, which is a true story. Um, so that gives you a little indication into, to my parents, uh, thinking and, and philosophy and state of mind at the time. But I, I grew up actually in the Midwest, um, first few years of my life on a, a farm called the sunshine farm, which was my mom's farm. And uh, it was just a really wonderful childhood, a great place to grow up uh, in Iowa. Um, And it was it was just a tremendous experience. But I think a lot of those roots were were really uh, significant in terms of my own personal journey and and thinking. I, uh, I ended up going to school in Boston for university and and then heading straight to the big city in New York uh, right after graduation. So it's been it's been a, a a long, interesting journey getting here. You studied was it communications in Boston? Yeah, I studied. Uh, I was part of a special program where you're actually in in two colleges at the same time. I was studying political science and I was studying communications. But was what was really I think significant is before I got to school, my, my mom, she worked at the University of Iowa. And so very early in my childhood, I had access to e- extraordinary technology. Uh, growing up, I had email and, and access to the internet uh, in the 80s. And so it was way before others we're really getting access to a lot of this technology. And it, it really was very formative for me. I had, for example, in high school, French pen pals, and we were doing live chat via the Minitel system, which was the French network. So even in, in high school, I was this was before the web or before things like AOL, I was able to have live chats with my pen pals. So going into school... I always had this affinity and this sort of background of technology, of communications, and really, I think that was rooted in, in the access to technology that I had uh, as a child. And what made you want to move from Iowa to Boston? I mean, that's a huge move for a teenager to make and a very different experience. What was the drive behind that decision? Yeah, I, th- I think it was um, really because of some early teachers that I had. I was always surrounded by wonderful teachers growing up. And they really opened my eyes and mind to the possibility beyond uh, Iowa, the, uh, the possibility beyond my, my surroundings. Um, so I just had in my mind that well, Boston was just such a, a mecca for education. Um, and I got a, a great scholarship to go there, and, and I was off to the races. So that that was just um, a, a great opportunity for me. Um, you know, I left Iowa when I was 18. And then when you're, you're in Boston, you're, you know, there's, I think, 100 colleges and universities in the area, surrounding area. So you're just surrounded by this very vibrant culture, 
uh, academia, great, great people. But you're also sort of wondering what's beyond what's beyond the academia uh, life, what's beyond university life, and where do you go from from Boston? But you go to New York City. So I immediately um, went to New York after graduation, and it was it was a really interesting time because it was the mid '90s, and it was this very exciting time. Uh, Netscape had had just gone public. The web was was the early early days of the web. AOL was just coming into play, and I got a job at a communications company in New York City. And it was just around the time that Silicon Alley, what they called Silicon Alley, was forming in in uh, in New York City. Of course, there was Silicon Valley on the West Coast, uh, but there was this emerging tech scene happening in New York City. And I got to really be surrounded by so many great entrepreneurs. Um, and, and through my first job, I, I got to work with a lot of these people and help launch many of the first internet companies, uh, companies like Daytech, uh, which was an online trading company like E-Trade before E-Trade, CD now, back when there were still CDs, um, I got to do really interesting technology programs for big companies like Disney and, and Payne Weber and, and really put in place their first internet communications programs. Uh, so it was just this really exciting time to be in New York because there was just so much energy happening, uh, so many entrepreneurs mixing with new businesses around advertising, new business models around e-commerce uh, and subscription models. So it was just a really wonderful time to be in New York. And I, I think back around those times because to me, in terms of where we are with digital health, it reminds me very much of, of 1994, 1995, 1996 internet. Yep. And I see a lot of corollaries to that. Yeah. And I want to get into that. And I think that's part of what I wanted to dig into in this conversation. I mean, you had exposure to computers and being able to, to chat and communicate with people probably 10, uh, you know, 12, 15 years ahead of a lot of people. And you chose communications and political science. You moved down to New York City like a lot of people do and got this great job where you were able to work with these great companies. Tell me, first of all, about the success you had, because I know you actually took a company public in the late 90s and were part of that team that actually helped uh, a company go public, which was a popular thing to do, but not everyone was successful doing it. You managed to do that. And then tell me about what happened afterwards that led you on this path to get involved in healthcare. Yeah, so it was it was really great. So um, I actually met my my business partner, Steve Klein. We, we've been working together 20 years now. So he was the CEO of a company, a startup called Webstakes. And there was just a few employees. I think there was 10, 11 employees at the time. And, and he actually recruited me to be his, uh, I don't know, I was like marketing director at, at, at the time. And, and very quickly, I ended up replacing the, the chief marketing officer. Um, and, and Steve and I became not only fast friends, but really just unbelievable partners. Um, we, we were going through just such an extraordinary experience of uh, building a startup but also preparing to go public and then eventually going public on NASDAQ. We, we went public on NASDAQ in uh, 1999. So it, those few years that we were going through that journey was, was just such an extraordinary experience. I was, when we IPO, to put this into context, I was only 26 years old. Uh, Steve was, was 29 when we were on the floor of the NASDAQ and, and sort of ringing the bell there. And so it, we were very young, but I think our naivete at the time was one of the great advantages we had because we didn't know what the rules were. We didn't know what we couldn't do. And therefore, we were just thinking very, very big. We were moving very quickly. Um, and we were trying to do things that had never really been done before. Uh, but it was it was also an internet data company. It was an internet technology uh, and marketing company. So while we were very excited about 
what we were doing and taking a company public, there was a missing element. Uh, which was a, a higher purpose, a, a, a different type of meaning behind what we were doing. So uh, I'll get into that and why that's important. But those early years were very, very important because it, it expanded our mind to the process of being entrepreneurs, to thinking um, about the impossible and to trying to do things uh, that, that others thought we wouldn't be able to do. So after you went public, I know that you joined as an entrepreneur in residence for was it Stone Investments, who was one of the biggest investors in the Web Stakes company that Stephen was the CEO of and that you joined. What happened after that? I'm trying to, to get an idea of the evolution from around early 2000s to 2011 when Startup Health was actually launched, because I know you did a variety of different things through there. And now you're, you, you're a contributing writer at Forbes and you write for TechCrunch and you're uh, obviously leading Startup Health and you're involved in a lot of different activities. I'm just trying to get a, a snapshot of that window from, say, 2002, 2003, 4 up to about 2011. What was the transformation that happened there? Yeah, we, it was it was a really exciting opportunity. So after we went public, I was asked to be a an entrepreneur in residence uh, for an investment firm called Stone Stone Investments, and they were our first investors. So it was really a connected uh, a connected group of people who I had been working with very closely, and and. The opportunity to be uh, an entrepreneur in residence, I think, is is one that if if you're listening and, and you ever get the chance to do, it's an extraordinary thing to do because you get to uh, basically go experiment. You get to go help build other companies. You get to go work within uh, in a, you know a group of investors, but. Uh, so you're sort of sitting on both sides of the table. I was working for the investors, but I was also working as as um, an entrepreneur helping build a company called the Privacy Council. And this was back in right around 2000. And at the time, there were these regulations like which are still around, like HIPAA, that were really very, very important in companies. Uh, healthcare companies, but also technology companies were trying to figure out how to sort of manage these regulations, um, how to comply with things like privacy policies. So we, we did a, created a solution there and, and it was really my first, uh, understanding or sort of interaction with the healthcare sector, um, and starting to understand the complexities of, the the healthcare industry, the regulatory environment, some of the big challenges and, and how that would impact other businesses. So it, it opened my eyes to other sectors beyond the technology and media sector. And it also uh, sort of spread my wings in terms of helping uh, build other startups from scratch. Uh, when I joined, I was, I think, the first employee of, of the Privacy Council after the founder. And, and we went through the process of, of building that company from scratch. And it was, it's, it's a hard, scary thing to do to, to start something from scratch. And, but it, it's also one of the most rewarding, one of the most exciting things to do. And that, that experience gave me the opportunity to, to really do that. We'll get right back to the interview, but first I wanted to tell you more about the Accenture Health Tech Innovation Challenge. You may already know that Accenture is a leading global professional services company offering services from strategy and consulting to digital transformation and technology. But do you know what Accenture is doing to tackle the world's biggest health issues? After the success of last year's Health Tech Innovation Challenge, Accenture is continuing to develop this event and bring together startups, life sciences companies, and healthcare organizations. And the best part is, you can apply to be a part of it too. You heard that right. Accenture's Health Tech Innovation Challenge is now in full swing. If you're a growth stage company seeking access to the top decision makers of large established companies and you have a beta product to demonstrate, Accenture invites you to apply to this year's challenge. And get this, the finalists will be invited to compete in San Francisco at the Startup Health Festival on Monday, January 8, 2018. Applications are open now, but don't delay. The submissions close on September 1, 2017. Get full details on their website by searching for Accenture Health Tech Innovation Challenge or simply click on the links in the show notes for this episode. Now let's jump back to the conversation. 
All right, we're back with our guest, Unity Stokes of Startup Health. Unity, you've taken us through. We're now at the point where you've spent some time as an entrepreneur in residence with the company Stone Investments. But then at some point, you traveled back to New York and you partnered back up with Stephen Krein. When did that happen and what were you two working on? In 2004, I moved back to New York to partner up with Steve um, again on something called Transformation Ventures. And and we were helping entrepreneurs uh, build uh, their companies. And, and what we did was we deconstructed all of the lessons learned from our experience in taking webstakes and promotions.com public. And we tried to figure out what, what really mattered. And we created something called the 10 laws of creating equity value. And it was, it was really just synthesizing down the things that really increased the value. Um, and what we found was we, during the time, many of the things we did created no value at all. But there were certain fundamental things that, that really moved the dial, that really made an impact. So we, we wanted to basically uh, document that and, and share that with other entrepreneurs. And, and that was when we really started working to help uh, other entrepreneurs. But we weren't focused on healthcare at the time. We were focused on just uh, working with, with any startups that were really trying to build a, an equity value company. So that's interesting. So Startup Health was not your first effort in trying to help companies get started and trying to utilize all of your entrepreneurial experience and success and trying to help other companies get to market faster. But like many of us who work in the healthcare sector, there was a personal experience that you had that refocused your attention on the challenges faced by those seeking better health. Can you tell me about that experience and tell me how you took that and then applied it to solving some of the problems that we're facing in healthcare? So something very significant happened. One of our uh, board members, previous board members from Webstakes and Promotions.com was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And his wife contacted, uh, contacted us and, and, and Steve and, and really asked if there was anything we could do to sort of search the internet and look for uh, potential solutions, any new treatments or new discoveries that may have uh, come onto the market. And it was during that experience we contacted Steve's brother, who's now our chief uh, medical officer, Dr. Howard Krein, who's a, a cancer surgeon. And it was that process that Steve and I really discovered a couple of things. One, how broken the health system is. Um, and two, we saw that there really hadn't been any innovation. I mean, the, there was WebMD and that was about it. Um, so in our experience online, we didn't see anything new. We were just blown away. So it was during that journey that we decided we wanted to use our entrepreneurial experience, our ability to um, you know, our networks um, and our time to do something more meaningful. We wanted to focus on health innovation. And this was uh, right around the time there was a whole group of, of Health 2.0, it was called at the time, companies that were just starting to emerge. These are companies like 23andMe and, and ZocDoc and patients like me um, that were all sort of trying to create new solutions around the same time. So we launched something called Organized Wisdom, which was one of the first digital health companies. It was an online uh, digital doctor's office, we called it. Um, it was a, a way to try to connect the patient and the clinician and, and organize the world's health in, uh, information and make it more accessible to people. So it was that early experience that uh, really gave us the impetus to focusing on health innovation. Um, and it was, it was really an, also an exciting time because, again, we felt like it was looking into a crystal ball. It felt very much like the conditions that we had seen uh, in the mid-90s as we were seeing the first internet companies come into play. And th there was this beginning wave of innovation and innovators and 
early uh, people that were starting to think differently about what was possible. And we, we were really excited to be a part of that. Is that when so you mentioned organized wisdom? Uh, that organization, I think you uh, formed it sometime two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Is that right? Yeah, it really got going, and I mean, sitting around the kitchen table around two thousand five, two thousand six. But um, we we raised some money, uh, vent, you know, as a venture back company in around two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and and it was during that experience uh, the first five years or so that were really critical. We, we were seeing that there was a lot of stagnation in the industry. We were seeing that there weren't enough investors in the sector. We were seeing that there still wasn't a lot of talent that had moved in in terms of entrepreneurial talent. They were all still going to Silicon Valley to build stalker apps and cube coupon and gaming companies and, and these types of things. Um, so we, we saw really a gap. There was a big gap in the market in terms of, of talent, but we also saw a huge opportunity, something bigger than we had ever seen before, to really rethink and reimagine what was possible. So Startup Health was born out of our experience building organized wisdom. It was it was such a challenging process. Uh, so many barriers uh, to entry, so many complexities, uh, such long sales cycles, uh, such um, sort of roadblocks during that journey that we decided to create an infrastructure, an organization, a platform that we wished we had as entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's, that's how Startup Health was born, in fact, was out of our journey and experience in building organized wisdom during those those early years from say 2006 to um, on the first five years there. So one of the points I wanted to get across though is you've been out there, you've been raising money on behalf of organized wisdom. You got some seed funding. Your Series A round uh, had Esther Dyson as one of the, the lead investors, right? And a number of other investors along with her. What was that like to be pitching in in a world, as you say, that everybody's headed west and going to Silicon Valley to build all these other couponing apps and everything else? Uh, 2008 also, incidentally, is the year that the App Store opened up in terms of access for developers, right? So it was a year after the launch of the iPhone that actually uh, was was available for people to develop. So it get, let, out, let loose a surge of creativity as people tried to get on this exciting new uh, mobile device. Um, but you managed to raise $2.3 million and a time when people were not really talking about technology for health. And you got some great investors, including Esther Dyson on board. What was that experience like? How many people did you talk to in order to raise that $2.3 million? And And uh, is that, I guess, part of the reason that you realized the story had to change and now you've moved on to becoming an investor? You know, this is, this is I think, a very valuable lesson to for, for others, hopefully, which is, you know, I, I interacted with Esther Dyson years before back when I just came to New York and, and when she was uh, doing her technology newsletter and I was interacting with her in Silicon Alley as, as part of that. So Steve and I actually knew her from our earlier days in the New York technology circles before we were even doing anything in healthcare. So you're building your personal network is, um, is something that carries with you hopefully forever if, if you're building it the right way. And so uh, many of our first investors were people that we had known for many, many years. So our, our first venture um, firm, 76 Capital, we, we knew them for many, many years. Many of our first investors, in fact, um, my first job uh, at Middleburg, Don Middleburg was one of our first angel investors. So he invested in in my first startup. Um, so, you know, I, I think we were very fortunate to have established great relationships with investors, with angels, with people that were willing to take a risk on us and, and back us. Um, because when we were out getting going, I mean, it was nothing more than, uh, you know, the, we were building the product. It wasn't even launched yet. 
so it was it was really a, a fortunate time. Um, and it was also a very risky time. You know, in, in New York, there were probably less than 10 digital health companies getting going at that point back when we launched Organized Wisdom. How did the idea for Startup Health actually come to be? Was it you and Steven sitting around a kitchen table and and working on something and say, you know what, we got to find a better way of doing this? And and what did you do next? Yeah, it was it was formed over over time, but we actually discussed it in a board meeting. And in fact, um, we we are very fortunate to have a, a tremendous board. Our executive chairman Jerry Levin. Uh, who uh, was the CEO and chairman of of Time Warner, um, helped disrupt many industries. We we were very fortunate to have really great people around us, um, both as advisors, as board members, and and also on our team. But but Steve Krein, my my business partner, had been part of an organization and still is for, for many years called YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And it's it's basically uh, a network of CEOs of entrepreneurs where they help each other and collaborate to help each other in forums. And it's a very powerful network and it gives you access to extraordinary wisdom and and other things. So we basically saw many other things that were happening in in other ecosystems and wondered why isn't there anything like this uh, in healthcare? There needs to be an entrepreneurial ecosystem to really speed up the cycles of innovation. So Startup Health was born out of our own needs and frustration in, in not having those ecosystems in, in healthcare. So we launched it really as an organization born out of our previous company, Organized Wisdom. And what happened was we were down at South by Southwest. And I was down there with with Steve and and Jerry Levin. And we saw Todd Park speak at uh, at South by Southwest. And and, um, he at the time, he was the CTO of HHS, Health and Human Services. And Later, he later became the CTO of, of the U.S. government uh, during the Obama administration. And we went up to him and pitched him our idea right after he got up, uh, off stage. And, and we basically said, we believe we can really be a big part of transforming health. Um, we've got this idea called Startup Health. Uh, we're going to help build a thousand companies over the next 10 years and create a hundred thousand jobs. And he said, can you launch startup health at help that a Palooza in six weeks? Uh, and we were like, uh, yes, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, and at the time we didn't even have a website. So it was, um, it, it was one of those moments where the stars aligned and we just, seize the moment and and really it just turned into such a a fast moving experience and it took off uh more quickly than we had imagined that it turned into this this sort of rolling thunder this this what became a fast moving sort of locomotive train that just burst out of the station and and we went with it so, th- I mean, that's another great lesson here, Unity, that you're sharing in terms of building your network over time, but then also seizing those opportunities. Because what would have happened if you hadn't had that conversation with Todd Park? You, you mean, you don't know, right? I mean, that, that moment was critical. Had you spoken to him in two weeks' time or in some other uh, venue, you may not have had the opportunity to, to – prepare for the health data palooza, which I'm sure scared the heck out of you (laughs) as you were looking at uh, uh, at that in the face. And you actually launched it in Washington, D.C., where health data palooza is held. But then you also had an opportunity to meet in the Oval Office with President Obama and Vice President Biden. What role did the political environment have for you at the time? Did it provide any particular momentum? Was the fact that Todd Park was coming to this new role and that that uh, President Obama had his new health plan. Did that provide some additional lift that you needed in order to take off? Absolutely. And and there was another gentleman, Anish Chopra, who was in fact the CTO of the U.S. 
government at, at that point in time. So he invited us to a meeting at the Oval Office the day before we were to launch Startup Health at Health Data Palooza. And it was, it was really this extraordinary moment because I was in jeans and a t-shirt setting up near Bethesda, Maryland uh, for this event, uh, getting our, our, our stand ready and getting ready. And I get a text from uh, my business partner, Steve, saying, can you text your social security number and birth date right away? Uh, we've just been invited uh, to meet with the vice president in the White House. And <laughs> wow. this was like 90 minutes I had to run from the the conference facility, go put on a suit and tie, figure out how to get uh, from Bethesda, Maryland to the White House uh, without taking a taxi. I jumped on the metro. Of course, it was 109 degrees in, in D.C. that day. Um, and I meet Steve outside of the, the gates of the White House and we go in and the next thing we're, we were sitting in the White House, uh, waiting to go into the vice president's office. Um, and it was just this amazing moment. We were pinching ourselves and, and, uh, we had the, the opportunity to first meet with the vice president who then brought us in to meet, uh, President Obama, uh, and we had an opportunity to share our vision with the president and vice president in the Oval Office the day before we were launching Startup Health. And it was just a, a very important moment because when we went down to the basement of the West Wing later that day to meet with, there were many CEOs, it was about eight or 10 CEOs of some of the, the country's largest healthcare companies. And then there was Steve and I representing the startup community. And it, it really put the wind at our back. It gave us an extraordinary, I think, standing that, hey, startups matter. Innovators matter. Entrepreneurs matter. And we matter, the, the government believes we matter. And at, at the time, there was a, a real sort of culture of supporting innovation. And I think that was a very meaningful moment. One of the great conditions that set off a wave of innovation around 2010 when health reform came in, um, 2010, 2011, was just a very meaningful time in terms of the support of the federal government also many state governments and local governments that were coming together to support innovators at a critical time. That brings us to the end of episode 38 and the end of part one of the interview with Unity Stokes. Can you imagine that? Getting a call and booking it across town in the summer heat to meet with the president and the vice president in the Oval Office and in the process launch Startup Health to the world. They got off to a great start and the journey continues. In the next episode, Unity tells us what the impact of the current political climate in the U.S. will have on health innovation. We also explore exactly what are the similarities between the tech explosion that happened in the 1990s to the health tech innovation that's happening today. He'll also discuss the vision they have to improve the well-being of every single person in the world. And we cover a lot more. You also have to hear his Yoda impersonation. It's one of my favorite parts in all of the 39 episodes we've released so far. Don't forget to check out all the information in the videos we have posted at digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 38. While you're online, don't forget to check out the Accenture Health Tech Innovation Challenge. Submissions close on September 1st, and the link can also be found directly in the show notes. Meet you on the flip side on episode 39 and part two of the interview with Unity Stokes. <laughs>